Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. It's that time again. We are waking up with watches, and everything you see here is for sale. Names, reference numbers, and when available prices in the description below. Reach out to Team also at thewatchbox.com to buy, trade, or sell. And if you're looking to sell, we are buying single watches or full collections. Team also at thewatchbox.com if you want to sell a watch, buy a watch, or trade a watch. Let's jump straight in with a big piece. Let's jump straight in with the F. P. Journe Tourbillon Souverain Vertical. This was effectively the 20th anniversary F. P. Journe Tourbillon launched in 2019. It is a larger, more complex, more exquisitely detailed, better finished, and frankly, much more expensive watch. Now, 20 years after his first subscription, Tourbillon Raymond Tour, F. P. Journe gave us this 42 millimeter platinum case that's not as thick as it looks. It looks thick, but it's 13.5. It's 52 millimeters lug to lug, but it's on the dial side where things really start to change. First, you can see that the entire dial is made of red gold. Artisanal elements are stepped up too, with a level of finish that is atypical of Journe watches. While they're typically a judicious blend of manual and mechanical finishing, this watch seems more clearly and extensively hand finished, justifying the price. You'll also find that the stamped brass subdials of the standard watch, the previous watch, have been replaced by Grand Faux Enamel subdials, a luxurious refinement on top of the red gold dial base. You'll also appreciate the power reserve has increased. It still runs backward, indicating zero when fully wound, but power has now increased from 40 hours to 80 hours. The tourbillon has changed too. You'll note it sits vertical on the dial. You'll also appreciate that it now rotates in 30 second circuits, a faster rate of rotation that has horological value, but frankly also looks cool. And it's surrounded by a black polished concave profile that allows you to view from certain angles the tourbillon as well as its reflection. Take a look. Note that both of the anchors on the flank of the tourbillon have been black polished, both screws and anchor plates. There's more going on here than meets the eye though. When you leave your watch on the desk at night or on the dresser at night, it's going to sit on its dial, it's going to sit on its case back, it's going to sit on its 9 o'clock side, it's going to sit on its crown. In every one of those positions, the tourbillon is arranged vertically. It is indistinguishable from a mechanical perspective which orientation the watch sits at night, and that is the purpose of the vertical tourbillon. Understanding that the watch is going to be off your wrist for at least a couple of hours every day, Jorn has restored the original anti-gravity purpose, or I should say gravity equalizing purpose of Breguet's pocket watch tourbillon. It's established in a wristwatch as that constant orientation and rotation of the cage helps to even out the timing error due to gravity, meaning that this watch effectively restores the value of the tourbillon in timekeeping. It's also free sprung with an overcoil hairspring made by hand. Now the finish is to a higher standard. As you can see, the movement is built to suit the larger case. It's all red gold, so with a red gold movement, a platinum case, and a red gold dial, this watch is hefty and impressive. You can also see that the level of finishing here, too, is higher than you would get in a standard F.P. Journe watch, as the entire structure underpinning the tourbillon, both the concave mirror as well as the structure adjacent is black polish. Now, black polish on rose gold is truly exquisite and impressive. It's not something you often see. It's something you hardly ever see. You'll also appreciate that the structure underpinning the opposite side of the carriage, as well as the Paul system for the Remontoir de Galité constant force device, all black polished. You can see the linear titanium spring. This is carried over from the original Tourbillon Remontoir, meeting out one second bursts of energy to the escapement so that the barrel never directly drives the tourbillon. The result is that if you wind the watch at the same time every day, the tourbillon will always retain the same amplitude to the benefit of isochronous timekeeping and ultimately precision. A truly impressive watch. But if you want to spend less money on your independent high horology luxury timepiece, I present the Kronos from Vincent Calabresi. Now, Vincent Calabresi is an AHCI member, and indeed a co-founder of the AHCI, best known for creating the Corum Golden Bridge in 1980. This watch is not that, but the Kronos is a lovely jumping, wandering hour complication featuring a custom-made image of Kronos pursuing a woman who seeks eternal youth. He represents the passage of time, which is why the pivot point at the center of the dial is an hourglass. This is a fun and serviceable watch built 
on an ETA 2892A2 base. It looks like it's in top or chronometer specification based on what I can see of the balance and the hairspring. Now the watch is 40 millimeters, but it has enormous strength, nuance of detail, and the impression of a larger piece. I'll throw it on my wrist. In fact, I'll show you this and the journe on the wrist. My wrist 16 centimeters. You can see how this case gives it a lot of presence without being huge outright. Again, it's only 40 millimeters and a great way to get into independent high horology from an acknowledged master for well under $10,000. We'll throw the Jorn on the wrist. As you can see, it features a matching platinum pin buckle. It is a remarkably substantial watch. And again, though it's a 42, eyes closed, the mass of this all precious metal block feels more like a 44 or a 45. It is truly special and a big technical and aesthetic upgrade from the original Tourbillon Souverain. Now let's say you want something a bit more durable. Well, Rolex to the rescue, and here's a watch launched in 2010 that has never been hotter than it is right now. A timepiece we call the Hulk. This is the Rolex Submariner 116610LV Lunette Vert, and indeed it does have a green ceramic bezel over a gold of sunburst green that Rolex originally described as green gold on the watch's release back in 2010. Now you can see the bracelet here, all of set and finished with the exception of the outer faces. This is the Oyster bracelet. It's tough stuff and it's reasonably discreet. And we're going to compare that in a moment to another Rolex that's a bit more glam. But what really sets the sub apart in day-to-day -day use from the other Rolex sports watches, save the Sea Dweller, is the glide lock system. You get 20 millimeters of adjustment, 10 increments in two millimeter increments. You can see that the watch is remarkably slim at only about 12.6 millimeters thick. It's one of the thinnest divers on the market, even though Rolex didn't express it the aim to make a thin diver, it wound up that way. Meaning this watch is easy to cuff underneath a sleeve. So while it's definitely a sports watch and 300 meters water resistant, this 48 hour automatic chronometer is also exceptionally good when it comes time to play nicely with formal attire, tight sleeves, and cuffs. Of course, the timepiece features one of the most refined bezels on the market. Let's have a listen. Sharp, precise, 120 clicks. Let's do a loom shot. Rolex Chromalite Blue. Rolex makes everything, including its own lubricants, its own dials, its own hands, and yes, its own loom. Plenty of loom to go around. This is Rolex Chromalite in blue. As with the Hulk, the Daytona has never been hotter than it is right now. Now, this variant was launched at Basel World 2016, but the basic six-digit Daytona with the in-house caliber 4130 goes back to Basel World 2000. So this watch has legs. No planned obsolescence here. It looks as good today as this basic design did when it debuted with the Zenith movement back in 1988. It's thin. It's only 12.2 millimeters thick. It's still 100 meters water resistant. It has a ceramic bezel. And if I'm honest, I like this look better than the white dial because frankly, the extension of the black of the dial into the bezel creates the impression of a more imposing and larger watch. Three-day power reserve, automatic winding. The watch features a vertical clutch and a column wheel for crisp actuation. I often describe the Longa Datagraph, the Rolex Daytona, and any Breitling with the B01 is having the most positive and tactically pleasing pusher feel, column wheel feel on the market. This is a watch that does it all. And I mentioned that this is a bit more glam than the Oyster on the Submariner. You can see the center links have been polished, but we don't get that full extension system inside the clasp. We have Easy Link, which is five millimeters in or out without a tool. All right, enough with sports watches. Let's talk about dress watches. And it is a fact of the market right now that precious metal dress watches are just about the best buy you can get in terms of discount from new when bought pre-owned. Let's talk a little bit about Breguet and Longa, starting with Longa, a model that ran over parts of two decades from the 90s to the 2000s. The basic 1815 is an extraordinary watch. You're getting a lot when you buy it. First, it's a discreet and traditional size. Same size as the Emil Longa limited edition. This platinum 1815 is 35.9 millimeters in diameter and just under eight millimeters thick. So it's thin, it's compact. It's for those who admire the mid-century modern era from the 40s through the early 70s of Swiss watch manufacture and Swiss watch design. It's true, a long zona wasn't necessarily part of that trend, but this watch effectively channels that era. And it does so with a size that's appropriate for unisex applications. The dial is sterling silver, and then it's galvanized the silver white. The case is platinum and the movement 
figuratively speaking, is solid gold. This is caliber L941, and you can see that it is a characteristic longer movement. In spite of not being a Zeitwerk or a Dottograph, not being complicated, it nevertheless exhibits all of the traits that Longa has made synonymous with modern German movement finishing, starting with the three-quarter style bridge, which is in reference and in deference to the Alongo Unzona pocket watches of the 19th and early 20th century. The material, golden-hued because the copper content, is nickel copper zinc, better known casually as German silver. Note the use of pivot jewels in golden chiton fixed in place by fired blue screws. Another pocket watch reference, mirrored engelage, a mile wide, glossy and gleaming, laid down by hand, and you can see that there is freehand engraving on the balance cocks. So the, no two of these, crafted with a burin, are ever exactly alike. You can also see black polish in the pegs that help to locate the movement, as well as the case clamp screws and the cover to the escape wheel and the swan's neck regulator. You are getting a lot of refinement. 45 hour manual wind power reserve, and it does feature hacking seconds. Breguet. Okay, this is a model that debuted back in 2016. Now, the 5177 here has a basket weave silvered guilloche dial, but don't be deceived, the dial is made out of solid gold. When this came out in 2016, the dial was possibly the most distinctive part of the watch. The case has been germane to the Classique series for decades, but the dial, with its combination of concentric brushing, dimples outboard of the hours, and a basket weave center, has enormous charisma, and Breguet is heavily invested in rose lathe machines that are traditional guilloche engines operated by traditional guilloche artisans. That allows fine details such as the engraved secret signature up at 12 o'clock to be placed on this dial. It's solid gold, it's then cut, it's then silvered in that order. At the center you can see fired steel hands, Breguet fashion, and it is a modern watch and function with both hacking seconds and a quick set date so you can rapidly cycle the date. Turn it all over, we have caliber 777 and it's a modern movement with traditional finish. Let's first talk about the traditional finish. You can see the rotor as with the dial has been cut on a rose lathe and if we look closely, we can even see the ambition of this finish as adjacent to the balance wheel, we have two inward angles where two mirrored bevels meet. We have those two sharp inward cleft creases. This is the kind of thing you won't see even on Geneva Hallmark movements. You'll also note that the stud holder and the regulator assembly on the balance, black polished, as well as all the screws which feature black polished tops and chamfered circumference and slots. The englage is big and broad. You'll note this level of englage and quality, the visibility of it without a loop, is usually exclusive to the best independents, but Breguet has gone above and beyond. Now, if you look closely, we also have some modern elements as there are ceramic rotor bearings that operate with high efficiency and unlubricated. And if we look at the balance wheel, you can see it is a free sprung balance for toughness with recessed bolts to minimize the tiny amount of aerodynamic drag caused by conventional rim bolts. You'll also note that the escapement you can just barely see it, iridescent purple blue under the balance wheel. The escapement is made of silicon and the hairspring is anti-magnetic silicon. Automatic winding, all of this comes with a 55 hour power reserve and it also has richly rolled Cote de Genève, and I will call them rolled Cote de Genève because they're laid down with an abrasive wheel. You can tell because on one side they're darker and lighter on the other side. That's abrasive wheel Cote de Genève versus the stamped phony kind. This watch is the real deal in every regard. Now here we have two different flavors of Royal Oak and they could not be more different. Let's talk first about the 15450. This is the modern day mid-size Royal Oak, the replacement for the long running 14790. It launched in 2012. It's about 37.5 millimeters in steel and you're getting everything that's great about a Royal Oak without the awkward fit. Now in practical terms, it fits like the jumbo. So this is 37 plus, it fits like the 39. On the wrist, it's comfortable. It's perfectly proportioned, perfectly dimensioned, and absolutely gorgeous. If you love the jumbo, but you don't want to pay the premium, this is a way to get a more durable and technically accomplished watch that looks and feels almost the same. Now, the timepiece on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist is very comfortable. It would be my choice in a heartbeat over a 15400 or 15500. The bracelet itself takes about 10 hours to manually finish, and you can see the degree of finishing with the polish between the intermediate where you ordinarily wouldn't be able to see polish. Those little intermediate ends have been polished. The edges 
of the individual links have been beveled such that they align perfectly all the way down the case as well as with the lug hood. And unlike Patek, AP uses screws for removable links, not pin sleeves. There's design continuity everywhere as the crease from the bezel runs through the case and the case back. And when we roll over to the crown side, you can see the screw down crown is hexagonal to match the inset white gold hexagonal bolts in the bezel. And of course, the, uh, basically the dial, the bezel, the entire frontispiece of the watch inspired by a vintage diving helmet. We have a grand tapisserie cut on a pantograph lathe at Audemars Piguet. Since 2012, they have done this in-house, cutting their half-nail dials using a 19th century mimicry engine. And unlike the Jumbo, this watch has the technically proficient and modern caliber 3120. It's physically tougher being thicker with a full balance bridge and a free sprung index. It has two features the Jumbo doesn't have in hacking seconds and a quick set date. And importantly, it features a 60 hour power reserve to the 40 of the Jumbo. While the Jumbo is 50 meters and this is 50 meters water resistant, this watch has a screw down crown and the Jumbo doesn't, which is why this watch, in my opinion, is safe for surface swimming. AP will back that up. I would not swim with a Jumbo. I would swim with this, however. Screw down crown, 100 meter water resistance, full Audemars Piguet factory diver style rubber strap, the Royal Oak Offshore 42. Now you can see the ceramic bezel sits on top of a steel case. Both are manually finished, and you can see some things are different on the dial side of this watch, with the mega tapisserie featuring lacquer over its surface to create a little bit more of a glossy gleam, polished shaft rings for the registers, and as you can see, applique vertically oriented Arabic numerals. The bolts on the offshore are steel rather than gold, and you can see that the chronograph pushers as well as the collar to the crown, all of ceramic, but note the attention to detail, as the sides and the outer face of the pushers are satinated, and then there are little bevels in polish. You can see the same contrasting the hood as well as the flanks of the crown. Even these tiny elements have been manually finished. Flip it all over, we have the same basic movement we saw before. Here it's called the 3126. It's technically identical, the only difference is it drives a Dubois de Praz 3840 vertical clutch chronograph module up on top. So you get, and this one's probably not wound enough to fire up, but you get a vertical clutch chronograph module on the top of the watch, which is why you might note the date on an offshore looks slightly sunken, as though it's, it's on a much lower plane than the, the dial. You can see the pushers are not in line with the crown. So the chronograph is actually on top of the base movement, which is why you look down through the module to see the date on the base caliber. Now it's running finally wound up. Again, this is the way to go if you want something that's bigger, bolder, but significantly also a lot more durable and water resistant. Throw it on the wrist. I wouldn't necessarily wear it on a wrist smaller than 15 centimeters circumference, but on the diver style strap, you're going to get the best fit on any wrist of any size. It's the most supple and pliant bracelet of any kind that Audemars Piguet offers with this watch. Now, let's say you don't have quite as much money to spend on your steel sports watch, but you want to get something from a major brand, and heck, why not keep it somewhat limited and exclusive? Well, I've got answers right here, starting with the 2010 Vancouver Olympics Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter. Now, this is a limited edition, of course, for the Vancouver Olympics in 2010, and they made 2010 pieces. It's basically everything you love about the James Bond Seamaster, albeit with some upgrades, starting with the red bezel. Most of these watches are blue or black themed, so to get the red bezel with the white lacquer dial, it really pops in a handsome contrast that, true, is emblematic of that Olympic Games, but also, frankly, a remarkably Swiss take on a Swiss watch. If you look at the dial, it's it's nothing like the old James Bond Seamaster that I wore back in 2002. As all of the indices are applique rather than printed, the dial is a rich white lacquer. There's actually an Olympic logo counterweight to the seconds hand, and then this is a coaxial chronometer. We're upgrading from caliber 1120 non-coaxial to the more technically proficient 2500. You get more power reserve, a free sprung index, the coaxial escapement, and it's still a COSC chronometer. Now you have the helium escape valve. This is the 41 millimeter case generation. Let's hear the bezel. As with the Omega, it is 120 click. You have those so-called Bond-style skeleton hands here. They've been slightly blackened to contrast against the dial base. And a bracelet that can best be described as halfway between a dress and a sports bracelet. You can see the oyster on the Hulk right here. Now, it's fairly austere, whereas the bracelet on the Omega is a combination of staggered link alignment, staggered link size, polished intermediates with its multi-link appeal and the rolled shoulder to the flanking links. It looks a little bit dressy, meaning this watch being considerably 
considerably thinner even than the current generation of the Diver 300 meter, is a wonderful companion if you do have to wear a tight cuff or sleeve, just as well as the Rolex will wear with formal attire, so will this. 300 meters water resistant, technically fascinating with the George Daniel coaxial escapement and very accurate as a chronometer. It's a fitting tribute to both Omega's Seamaster line and, of course, the Olympic Games. But if you prefer Summer Olympics in Rio, let me introduce you to the 2016 Omega Seamaster Bullhead Chronograph. Now, in 2013, Omega launched its modern-day Bullhead, 669 pieces in three editions, each of 669. This one is only 316, making it the rarest of the modern Bullheads, and in my opinion, the most attractive. Of course, it pays homage to the 1969 reference 146011 Seamaster Bullhead Chronograph, and to that end, you can hold it and use it like a stopwatch in your hand. It was designed to be used as such, it continues to function well as such, but it's an unusual watch. As you can see, there's a lot of Olympic theme here. Starting with the bezel and the Olympic colors, you can see there's also contrasting stitching, no fewer than four individual colors in the strap itself, which is an interesting hybrid of a rubberized outer portion and leather inside. It's a little bit like a vintage Panerai strap from the 90s. Though the watch is un conventional in its shape, you can see it does use standard lug junctions, so you don't need a proprietary strap. You can go aftermarket if you want. There's a full deployment clasp that has a minderless system hiding excess length underneath, and you can see the case is quite faithful to history as it features the lapping machine laid radial satin finish all the way around, a little bit of a bevel on the flank, and then horizontal satin finish. Take note that this is a case that is monoblock on the top, as there is no discrete removable bezel. You have to flip the watch over, and you can see that the dial as well as the movement load through the case back, creating a seamless aesthetic that's remarkably vintage, true to life, and awesome on the front. I mean, it's just a cool looking watch. Having no visible removable bezel makes this almost alien to traditional horology. Now you have an internal rotating bezel, and that bezel has a 60 minute scale. So you can see the chronograph only covers 30 minutes. The bezel has a 60 minute scale. You'll also appreciate a few refinements, such as hacking seconds and a quick set date, and take note, it is a column wheel chronograph, even though the movement's based on a Valjoux 7750. More on that in a moment. The Crown is possibly the most fascinating found on any Omega watch, as it requires only a quarter turn to lock or unlock. There's a little black index, you line it up, then you turn, one quarter turn, and it's locked. Of course, the watch has a caliber 3113 inside, which is a rare coaxial conversion of a Valjoux 7750. You get a lot of big upgrades over a 7750. Free sprung balance more power reserve, a chronometer certification, a coaxial escapement. You've got the stop seconds and the hacking, which are germane to the 7750, but all of the Omega mods, which are not. The timepiece is also 150 meters water resistant, so you're going to get a lot of use out of this watch, high and dry or offshore. Remember, the Summer Olympics includes both onshore and offshore games. The fit is unusual, though it's a 43 millimeter watch, and visually, it has a significant signature and an impressive wrist presence. Nevertheless, it's also only only 43 millimeters from lug to lug, meaning across the wrist, it's actually shorter than a Rolex Datejust 36. And you can see the case back is curved, somewhat like a Richard Neal Tonneau. This is a very special watch and one of my favorite modern Omegas. Vacheron and the Catalil. This is a timepiece that's difficult to describe primarily because all of the original pitch back in 2008 for the Catalil was the dial and the anti-counterfeiting technology that it included. You could see there is laser engraving without ink, laser engraving with ink. There is microfilm borrowed from currency technology used to prevent counterfeiting of banknotes. Uh, there is text that only appears under UV. You can see there is microtext on the dial, as well as micro patterns that are exceedingly difficult to create without the specific microfilm technology used. There's also metallization, which is basically a nickel deposit on the crystal itself to create metallic characters. This might be overkill, as I found Vacheron and typically highly finished haute de gamme watches are the least likely to be successfully counterfeited and marketed. Most people looking for a watch like this know what to look for, and recreating them, even in a facsimile, is hard. This watch also exhibits some of the other features of the original 2008 Catalil, including a composite case that could be customized by the user. This one uses a combination of grade 5 titanium and red gold for a look unlike anything else. Now take a quick look at the dial 
while, you can see the caliber 2475 includes both a day date and a power reserve, so this is a complication, and Patek owners take note, there is a hacking seconds function. Flip it all over, and you have Geneva Hallmark caliber 2475, nicely built. You'll appreciate the fact that this watch is substantial on the wrist without being a sports watch. The Kitalil traditionally was designed to be a rather significant, imposing, and modern-day dress watch that was going to be a little bit intimidating alongside a conventional patrimony or Calatrava, and frankly it is that. It's almost 50 millimeters from lug to lug and 41 millimeters across, so think sports watch present, but dress watch refinement. And of course, getting all of the movement action on the dial side is part of the package. And yes, the watch is impossible to counterfeit. Something old and something new. This watch embodies both. A tribute to the original 1963 debut Carrera. This is the Tag Heuer Carrera 160th anniversary model. Looking back to 1963, the watch has a no-date dial with a sunburst silver center, a little bit of Fotina. I know that's a controversial element, but it is a handsome complementary color that prevents this all-silver watch from being a little bit sterile and cold. The warmth continues as we look at the lugs. This is the real signature of any Carrera. Integrated, thrusting, angular, and frankly, a little bit outsized and out of proportion to the case. It has always been the signature of the Carrera, giving a 39 millimeter case an outsized personality presence and frankly an impressive wrist stance in spite of traditional sizing. Now things become even more interesting when you flip the watch over as there's the Caliber Hoyer 02 on the back. Let me get that cord out of the way. Now you can see that the Caliber is the more modern and technically proficient of the two. You remember the 1887 based on a Seiko 6S 78. This is not that. This is all built in Chevenet, designed by Tag Heuer. You'll note that it is 80 hours power reserve, vertical clutch, column wheel, and unusually for the Carreras, 100 meters water resistant, as these were not traditionally aquatic sports watches, and yet this limited edition of 1,860 pieces is. I'll also mention that the watch features very little tag acknowledgement. The dial is signed Hoyer. The crown is signed Hoyer. The buckle is signed Hoyer. The only place where you will see tag written is on the rotor itself. This is a watch that has a lot going for it as it combines the look of the original Carrera, which frankly is pretty close to perfection, with modern day running gear, water resistance, fit, finish, quality, and materials. And of course, this being a 2020 model year watch now available on the pre-owned market, you really are getting the best of everything in one package. Another recent edition, now available pre-owned, this is the Grand Seiko SBGW 262. Now this model, of course, being a remarkably wearable 39 millimeters with Zeratsu polished yellow gold, it's also a handsome no-date Maki-E Arushi lacquer dial on top of a three-day power reserve manual wind caliber 9S64, all of which was created custom for this model, part of the Elegance collection. You'll note it's under 12 millimeters thick with a lovely plexiglass inspired domed crystal in sapphire. Uh, take a look at the case. There's not a ton of Zoratsu tin plate polish here, but what's there is optically smooth, mirror finished, and very much like Swiss black polish, the black polish that I showed you on movements, but Grand Seiko executes this kind of manual finish on objects the size of cases. The dial is high-grade Urushi lacquer. It does have organic basis. It's essentially created from tree sap with iron elements added to create the black of the dial, which is lovely, glossy, gleaming, bottomless, and looks wet. And then the Maki-E technique is used to build up the indices and the numerals. So they're actually three-dimensional, and they're built up from a powdered paste that allows them to have height and volume above the dial. Note that the hands themselves are also manually finished using diamond-tipped milling tools, satin on their top with razor-like mirrored facets on their side. And of course, on the case back, you have that Caliber 9S64 manual wind with a three-day power reserve adjusted to six positions, not the COSC chronometer standard of five. So this is a watch that goes above and beyond in every regard. A truly handcrafted work of art, front and back. It's a timepiece that does not include the most finish-intensive movement. All of the hand finishing of this watch is visible externally on the case and the dial, and make no mistake, it's as fine, if not more so, relative to anything you will see in Switzerland.
Speaking of independent horology now, you could argue that Seiko and Grand Seiko, being part of a group that's beholden to no other watch brand, are technically an independent, but that's not really what we think of when we think of independent horology. We think of F.P. Journe and De Betun, two companies that combined make maybe 1,000 watches a year. Let's speak about the Santagraph Souverain first. This is a watch that won the GPHT Aiguidor, or the Grand Prize, at the Watchmaker's Oscars. Not the best chronograph, not the best men's watch, the best watch overall. And here's why, it's the innovation. It's called the Santagraph because it can measure 1 100th of a second. It's Foudreon flying second dial can measure 1 100th of a second, even as its other registers measure 20 seconds and 10 minutes, respectively. There is a patented rocker system that gives the watch mono pusher elegance, but the ability to stop and restart like a conventional chronograph. Now, resetting this watch is a wonderful piece of horological theater, and you can see there are three tachymeter scales that allow you to gauge the speed of an object between, for example, 36,000 and 6 kilometers per hour. The dial side is rose gold precious metal with a black polished steel inner bezel for framing the sub-registers and fired blue Jorn biomorphic style steel hands. The case, 40 millimeters in rose gold, is the standard Santagraph size, as this model was never available in the 38 millimeter conventional case. It was always a 40 millimeter or larger watch in its dress and sporting iterations. It's visually spectacular, but it's also very wearable, being only 10 millimeters thick and 48 millimeters lug to lug. Now firing it up one more time, we're going to go to the reverse side. The watch has an 80 hour power reserve if the chronograph is not running. But even when the chronograph is running, though power reserve is reduced to 24 hours, and remember, it's a 10-minute chronograph, so you have no need to run it full-time, but when the power is reduced by operation, balance amplitude nevertheless remains constant. The second patent of this watch, and you can see the movement is made of solid 18 karat rose gold, but the second patent deals with driving the chronograph off the axle or the arbor of the barrel and driving the time off the toothed edge of the barrel, creating two parallel drivetrains such that power reserve is affected, but balance amplitude and timing proficiency are not affected with the chronograph running. Truly a spectacular watch, both to the eye and to the intellect. Now, De Betun of Lauberson, Switzerland, is in many regards a contemporary of F.P. Journe as Denis Flageolet, co-founder of De Betun, and F.P. Journe were actually partners in a company called THA, and during the 90s, they co-developed a mono-pusher manual wind chronograph caliber for Ulysse Nardin and Cartier. That movement was used as the Cartier MC045 in watches such as the Cartier Tank, or I should say Tortu mono-pusher, this watch right here uses that same movement, which by this point had been purchased by De Betun, to be used exclusively by it, having been developed by Denis Flageolet and then used in Denis Flageolet's own watch. This is effectively an in-house caliber. The watch is thin, under 10 millimeters, 46 millimeters lug to lug, and 42.5 millimeters in diameter. This is the launched in 2004 DB8W, W for white gold. Now, De Betun executes conventional rose lathe guilloche on the dial, which has a billowing center section, a sunken register, and then you can see all of the indices, all of the scales and numerals are in transferred navy blue. You have fired steel hands at center, and then down at the base of the dial, you have a 45 minute scale. This is different from the original DB1 chronograph of 2002. The DB1 had a 30 minute scale. This is a 45 minute scale. Why? It's rumored that Denis Flageolet is a soccer fan, pardon me, football, and he wanted to create this watch as effectively an homage timepiece. Now it has a coaxial mono pusher in the crown. That's how you operate it. It's a manual wind movement with a 42 hour power reserve, and as you can see, production was very, very low. This is number 10. Back then, De Betun was making between about 100 and 200 watches a year. At its peak production from 2011, to 2014, it made about 400 per year, and today, seeking exclusivity and working extensively in bespoke commissions, De Betun makes about 150 a year, so this watch is part of a rare breed. Throw it on the wrist, and it's frankly the most wearable borderline 43mm watch you'll ever encounter. It's thin, it's short across the wrist. The movement inside, a column wheel, mono pusher, manual wind, oscillating pinion movement is horologically significant. The dial is handmade, and it's part of a company that today represents the avant-garde in independent horology. One other feature I like here is the use of an oscillating pinion for the chronograph, which means though it's a lateral clutch, 
Nevertheless, it has a smooth actuation that belies its architecture, so it doesn't have the jump of a conventional lateral clutch. It starts without stagger the way a vertical clutch would. Like I said, an impressive movement by Denis Flageolet and F.P. Journe inside a watch that is all Denis and frankly, co-founder of De Betune, David Zanetta. If you look at the edges of the case, you can see the ogival or torpedo-shaped lugs. This is the only element of De Betune design from the early days that survives today, as if you look on the floating lugs of the DB28, you'll see that same torpedo-like or rocket cap ogival form at the very end of the DB28. This is a company that is not afraid to change the script. Well, we were always going to finish with a big piece, and though it's 40 millimeters, they don't come much bigger than this. Launched at Basel World 2016, this is the Patek Philippe 5204-1R, the red gold split seconds perpetual calendar chronograph. As you can see, the dial is black and gloriously contrasted with the white and red gold indices. Surprisingly, this watch is loomed, and... As you'll see on the wrist, despite being an overpowering power watch, and it is a power watch with a capital P, it wears easily. 40 millimeters is hardly gargantuan, and as you can see from lug to lug, even with the bracelet, the watch is relatively narrow, so you could wear it on a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. Patek case making has come a long way since 1981 when the company purchased a case maker and started churning out its first vessels. You'd see that the lugs are welded on with an incredibly sharp break between the lug and the case, that speaks to advanced hand finishing. You'll also note that the fluting of the lug profile, the step of the bezel, and the concave profile of the bezel add up to a watch that is frankly just gorgeous in detail. And that's before we get to the complication. A split second chronograph with a perpetual calendar. This is of course a tradition that was begun in the mid 90s by the original 5004. This watch is larger, more durable than the original, and technically upgraded in several regards, starting with the fact that this version of the watch includes a in-house caliber rather than a Lemagne base. You can see right here caliber 29535 and it is a 65-hour power reserve. It is a manual winder. It is a double column wheel. You can see the extraordinary architecture. Let me do my best to show you the extraordinary architecture of the Rattrapon. And you can see two column wheels a forest of springs, levers, bridges, and wheels, and a free-sprung balance beating away at 28,800 vibrations per hour. And in case you worry about refinement, one of the key refinements people always ask for with Patek watches is present and correct, as this watch does feature hacking seconds. This is a timepiece that puts it all together and offers everything a person could want in a watch. Everything, perhaps, but discretion, as a full red gold Patek complication on a matching bracelet is never going to be anonymous. But hey, this is the ultimate power watch from Miami Beach, the Sunset Strip, the Italian or the French Riviera, or for that matter, the deck of your yacht at the Monaco Grand Prix. Let's do a loom shot real quick because this one's loomed. And we're back. A Patek Philippe Grand Complication that's fully loomed and visible at night. Who knew? For that matter, here's the Omega Seamaster Vancouver Edition, just cause. And to put them all to shame, here's my Zen Easy M1. Thank you to all. Team also at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details. Time out, Tim out, and thank you for logging on.